2 Timothy 2.15 is a verse that we talk a lot about uh, being a uh, church that rightly divides the word of truth. Uh, that that's a big part of our ministry is to emphasize who and what God has made us in Christ. And uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 15, the verse tells us to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we've been talking, using this verse to, for our studies on dispensation, dispensational Bible study, uh, the advantages of studying your Bible by rightly dividing or making uh, the distinctions that God makes in his programs in the scriptures. And so we've, we've, been, we've spent quite a while working on this, and um, the, the topic that we're talking about is the promise of the Spirit, the promise of the Holy Ghost, the promise of the Spirit. And so Matthew chapter 3, in verse 11, we've been uh, talking about the fact that when, with John's ministry, he tells the little flock of believers that he's called with the water baptism of repentance, the baptism of repentance. Israel, under the law, was told that uh, by Moses, God revealed through Moses, that Israel, under the law program, would be blessed in their crops and in their fertility as a nation and the fertility for their flocks. They would be blessed in all their, uh, in all their, their economy, if you will. Uh, and in their lives, uh, blessed being protected from diseases, and God's blessing would be on that nation, protect that nation from their enemies, as long as they abided under the law. But if Israel forsook God's law and, and began to worship other gods, uh, God told Israel under the law co covenant that God would add curses to that nation. And there were five cycles of judgment that it talks about in Deuteronomy 28, 29:30, Leviticus 26, uh, the first giving of it. Um, but there are courses of judgment. And Israel, through its history, uh, God told Moses that Israel was going to fail under the law. They had the opportunity to abide under the law, worship God, keep God, uh, Jehovah as their God, as a nation. They had the opportunity and have all his blessings. But instead, he told Moses the children of Israel aren't going to abide under my law. They're stiff-necked people. They're not going to do it. And, and as a result, they're going to be carried away into their enemies' lands. But if they, when they're carried away into the en their enemies' lands, if they just recognize, repent, recognize that we deserved all this judgment to come upon us as a nation. We deserve to be our, to carried out, out of the promised land that God promised to Abraham. That God would remember his covenant that he made to Abraham and restore Israel in that kingdom. And God is going to do that. that. That's to happen in the future. In fact, when the Lord Jesus Christ came uh, and was uh, made flesh and, and he was born of the Virgin Mary, the plan with, with uh, God's prophetic purpose was for him as Israel's Messiah to come and then uh, the book of Daniel chapter 9 mentions that the, their Messiah would be cut off and there would, be a, there would be a time period and then he would come back to set up his kingdom. And, but those prophecies in the Old Testament, they, the Lord Jesus Christ in his, in his earthly ministry was preparing the little flock of believers, the people that his disciples, people that followed him, the multitudes, he was preparing them to go through this tribulation period. The, the seven years of judgment that would happen uh, in that tribulation period. We know that that hasn't happened yet. Uh, he told that nation, uh, those he ministered to, this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. And you will, you, he sent them out in, in the commission, the, the disciples, and he says, you won't cover all the cities of Israel until I return. And, and then he told them also that he would... He would be uh, crucified, buried, and he'd raise, be raised up the third day. And, and so he, he gave them all that information up front, but he was preparing them to go through this tribulation period. But we know, of course, God interrupted Israel's program uh, because we've had 2,000 years so far in this dispensation of grace, and that generation did pass away. 
And those things weren't fulfilled. And as the Lord was preparing those believers to go through, sell all the things that they had. He told Peter, you know, all the disciples when he chose them, sell your businesses. Uh, the, they had all things in common in, in Acts chapters 1, 2, and 3. Uh, the, the believers were uh, multiplying in number. But what happened uh, with that promised, the promises that God gave to their prophets, they weren't fulfilled in the time frame that, that they were prepared to uh, receive. The information and prophecy did not allow for this 2,000 year period dispensation of grace. Now, John here in Matthew 3 is, is his job is to be the forerunner for the Lord Jesus Christ. His job is to introduce the Lord Jesus Christ to Israel as their Messiah, the one that was promised to come. And he says uh, in verse 7, uh, he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees uh, that had come to his baptism. And he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from what? The wrath to come. This right here. This is where they were at in the program. Like, like we had the page turn. The program prophetically, they understood their Messiah would be cut off. But they also knew that there were going to be seven years of great tribulation. And then the Lord would set up his kingdom. Um, but they didn't know that there would be a, this 2,000 year time period. And John's saying to those Pharisees at his baptism, who's warned you to flee from this? They were expecting to go through it because in verse 11 he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that is come that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with what? Fire. That's this right here. He's talking to that generation. And so we've, we're going to look this morning at this. What we're looking at now is the promise of the Spirit. And that's the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost that's referenced here in verse 11. So the baptism of the Holy Ghost, when John tells them, your Messiah is here, your King is here, and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost, that's not new to Israel as far as those who understood the prophecies. That's not mystery truth that's now revealed for the first time through John the Baptist to Israel. Israel had the promise of the Holy Spirit. In fact, it's the way that Israel's going to receive eternal life, just like we receive eternal life. When we trust the gospel, Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. The moment you trust the gospel, uh, God the Holy Spirit, uh, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. That's the body of Christ, the, the group of believers, the living organism, the church, the body of Christ, the largest church in, in the world. All believers are members of the church, the body of Christ. And so the moment you trust the gospel, God the Holy Spirit responds to your faith. God, the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1. Uh, the, 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 the Word of God effectually worketh in you that believe it. The Gospel is the power of God. You believe it. It effectually works in you by the Holy Ghost taking you, making you one with the Lord Jesus Christ. He, for God hath made Him, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God where? In Him. It's a spiritual union with Christ that gives us eternal life. That was promised to Abraham back here, eternal life. He told Abraham, I'm going to make you and Sarah a great nation. And he, he told him that I'm going to give you this land to inherit from the, we don't have the map up here, but from the river Euphrates, way up above Israel, uh, down to the, the river of Egypt, and over, the boundary is way over on the right side, on the other side of the Dead Sea. And all that land is going to be Israel's possession. He told Abraham, I'm going to give it to you for an everlasting possession. How do you possess something for eternity? If God gives you something that he says, you can have this and you can have it forever. What does that mean? That means you're going to have eternal life. Eternal life was first promised by covenant to Abraham. 
And that covenant was not a conditional covenant like blesses and blessings and cursing that God made the covenant with Israel under the law program. To Abraham, there was no condition. Abraham believed God and God counted it unto him for righteousness. And the promises, the covenant, he tells them that you need to be circumcised and anybody who's not circumcised has broken my covenant. It's part of what came along with the covenant God made with Israel that they would be circumcised. He wanted them to be distinct from the rest of the nations and Israel needed a sign to show them that they were, their, they were God's people. And, and, uh, but, but it was the unconditional covenant that God made with Abraham. So he says uh, in Matthew 3, I indeed baptize with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier, mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So there's a judgment that's going to come for Israel before the Lord sets up his kingdom. The believers are baptized with the Holy Ghost. The unbelieving part of Israel are burnt up in the fire. And this will resume the prophetic program after the catching away of the church, the body of Christ. And Israel's going to go through a judgment, and God's going to purge the unbelievers out of Israel that are on the earth at that time, uh, at the end of the second half of the tribulation period. And Israel's going to be burned up, the unbelievers, with this fire judgment, a purging, a purifying of Israel. And then the Lord's going to set up His kingdom, and the believers who are baptized with the Holy Ghost are going to go into... Um, now, just because water baptism, uh, uh, John the Baptist preached... Uh, and, and told Israel, I baptize you with water, the water of repentance. That's salvation, the faith in the gospel. The water didn't save, save Israel. And this Holy Ghost, being baptized with the Holy Ghost that happens at Pentecost, it didn't save those believers when they were filled with the Holy Ghost. When we trust the gospel, the Holy Ghost doesn't save us before we trust the gospel. The Holy Ghost doesn't enter into us before we trust the gospel. It's faith in the gospel that results in God the Holy Spirit regenerating our spiritual nature, God the Holy Spirit indwelling us. And, and so that manifestation of the Holy Spirit that takes place at Pentecost with these tongues uh, that takes place, we don't speak in tongues. We can't speak another language. It'd be hard for me probably to learn another language. I, but, and I think it is a wonderful thing that God basically reversed the tongues of Babel uh, with, the, with the sign to Israel at Pentecost that these disciples were speaking in the languages that everyone out there could hear him speaking in his own native tongue. He's speaking one thing, but they're hearing him in different languages. It's like uh, United Nations uh, was the first to, to have a deal where they, they had ear uh, pieces in whenever they were having their meeting. And they could hear the interpreter would tell them what the speaker was saying in their language. I mean, it's, it's what happened at Pentecost with the disciples being able to speak and they could understand them in their own native tongue. So um, that manifestation of the Holy Spirit, we know the Corinthian church spoke in tongues. So that's something that happened after uh, the Lord, um, after Paul was uh, out in the first and second missionary journeys, uh, he established the church in Corinth. And that church was the only church that it says spake, spoke in tongues. But there was a reason for that. That church was joined next to a synagogue. And as part of pa Paul's ministry in the book of Acts, he's God's using Paul to provoke Israel to jealousy. Israel's sign gifts go from the little flock over to the church, the body of Christ in that church. So they could see that what Paul was doing in the gospel he was preaching was God's program. That God was giving these gifts to show Israel that they had been set aside as a nation, reckoned among the Gentiles, and now salvation was through Paul, through the gospel he preached. Prior to Paul preaching that Christ died for your sins, the gospel in time past, the kingdom gospel, was to believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. Paul goes on to say that Lord Jesus Christ died to pay for your sins, Gentiles, and if you trust in his death as payment for your sins, God will save you. You receive the Holy Ghost. So salvation is only by being identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't understand that back here. As a matter of fact, part of Paul's revelation, the significance of the revelation given to Paul for us, 
is an explanation, a detailed explanation of how God saves us, how justification has been by faith. How is that possible? Well, when you trust the gospel, like we said, God the Holy Spirit identifies you with Christ and you're, you receive His perfect righteousness applied to your account. Your righteousness is in Christ. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We don't have righteousness. We need to be made righteous. And Israel learned under the law as a schoolmaster, they needed to be made righteous and they needed to be looking for their Messiah to come to save them from their sin problem so that they could be saved from the curses of the law that the law brought upon them so that they could be delivered from their enemies. But it was a sin problem that they needed a Messiah who would be their Redeemer and Savior. So I want you to look with me here. This promise that God, go with me if you would to... Deuteronomy chapter 30. I want you to, I mentioned before and mentioned recently that we would talk about these promises. The promise of the Holy Ghost wasn't new revelation. And here we are in, I told you, Deuteronomy 28 through 30 a, little, a few minutes ago was where God told Moses to, the information for Israel's law covenant. It was a contract. And you could start reading in verse 28. We're going to start reading, or chapter 28. We're going to start reading uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1, though. So it says, And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and thou shalt and shalt return unto the Lord. There's, there's a repentance. And shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, the law. Thou and thy children with all thine heart and with all thine soul. So to love the Lord with all their heart and all their soul. That's faith. And in my estimation, the word faith doesn't appear very often in the Old Testament, actually. But there over and over, this commandment to love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul is mentioned. And to me, that's, that's salvation. That's faith in God. Uh, you have to love the Lord uh, before you receive eternal life from Him. Uh, that, that love is understanding. He's the God that created all things. He's your, you're accountable to God. Uh, that's, that's what repentance um, is about. It has to do with the conviction of your sins and trusting in God to save you because He's the God of love who will save you from your sins. So they're to love the Lord with all their heart and with all their soul, that then the Lord thy God, at that point, when they're, again, uh, the part, first part of uh, verse 1 says, when all these things are come upon you, the curse has come upon them, and they're uh, scattered throughout the nations. Verse 3, when they repent, then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from the nations, whither the Lord thy God has scattered thee. And if any of, thy, if any of thine be driven uh, out unto the uttermost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee, and the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good, and multiply thee above thy fathers. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, and the heart of thy seed, to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. That's eternal life. Uh, keep Deuteronomy chapter 30 here. I want you to look at verse 19 with me. We want to read this. I call to he and we're still in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life, and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord thy God swear unto thy fathers Moses. Was it Moses that God gave Israel a covenant with Moses, the law covenant, to receive the land as an everlasting possession? No, it says that the Lord God swear unto thy fathers Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. So God, when Israel fails under the law covenant, the law was again a schoolmaster, according to what Paul tells us in Galatians 3. 
to lead Israel to Christ, to lead the world to Christ, right? To show them that they're sinners who need a Savior. But it was the promise of eternal life was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for Israel to have that land as an everlasting possession. Now I want you to go uh, to Ezekiel chapter 36. So the covenant God made with uh, Abraham is the covenant that Israel was promised eternal life. And then it's through the new covenant that replaces the, <clears throat> the Old Testament, the old covenant. Ezekiel 36. It's through the new covenant which Christ ratified with his blood at the cross. He ratified the blood of the new covenant so that Israel could have that heart, be given that heart to love the Lord thy God, their God, with all their heart, mind, and soul. Now in Ezekiel 36, we're going to start in verse uh, 24. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Now doesn't that resonate what we just read back there in, in, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30? I mean, that's the same thing Moses just told him. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. That's what we read back in, there in chapter 30. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments to do them. So God is going to make Israel righteous through uh, the sprinkling and cleansing that we know turns out to be the cross. Isaiah 53 talks about the Lord going to the cross, and by their stripes are, his stripes they're healed. They're, they needed a Messiah to die to pay for their sins, and that that it's through a new covenant that he makes that replaces the law covenant that, by which they all, that nation failed and were under the curses of God because the unbelieving uh, apostate Israel that crucified their Messiah, same group, unbelieving Israel, uh, weren't going to trust in Christ for their salvation. They weren't going to trust in God uh, to save them. They were a hard, stiff-necked people. <clears throat> but the believing remnant who had the faith of Abraham under the new covenant will be able to be made righteous and they'll be that righteous priestly nation the, the royal priesthood that will evangelize the, the rest of the nations in this thousand year reign of christ on the earth they're the ones that are going to go in they're they're the ones that at pentecost the believers at pentecost received the holy ghost um, that now there was particularly in in acts chapter 2 it was the apostles and the disciples 120 but afterward, you know, Cornelius spoke in tongues when he got saved from, from the kingdom gospel that was preached to him by, by Peter. He spoke in tongues. So speaking in tongues was by many believers, but it was that believing part of the Israel, the believing remnant, the little flock we refer to them, that received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, not the unbelieving part of the nation. And so... I um, want you to go with me now to, uh, if you're in Ezekiel 36, go over to chapter 37, look at verse 14. Chapter 37 of Ezekiel, verse 14. And shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land, that you, sh you know, that ye know, that I, the Lord thy God, have spoken it, that I, the Lord, hath spoken it, and performed it, saith the Lord. So this, the baptism of the Holy Ghost wasn't the first time through John that this information was revealed to Israel. This is part of the prophecies that went on before uh, by all God's holy prophets since the world began. Uh, this is part of that revelation. And look at chapter 39, verse 29. We'll see it again. Chapter 39 of Ezekiel, verse 29. Neither will I hide my face anymore from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. So that's part, now we know through Paul's revelation, the way we're saved is the moment you trust the gospel, the gospel is the power of God and salvation, and then you also learn through salvation is by sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. It's when you trust the gospel that God the Holy Spirit identifies you, baptizes you into Christ. That's Romans chapter 6, that dry baptism, one baptism he talks about in Ephesians 4. So the Holy Spirit being... We receive the promise, and I want you to see this. Uh, go to Joel now, chapter 2. 
And we're going to look at verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters, who's he talking to? He's talking to Israel, right? And your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into blood or into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. So we know it's talking about that that uh, tribulation period uh, that's going to take place. Those those uh, events in the latter part of this chapter, verse 30, uh, 31 and 32 take place. When the, with the uh, second half of the tribulation period, with the revelation, the book of Revelation expounds on that and gives you more information about those judgments, the day of the Lord, uh, verse 31. But, um, but this giving of the Holy Spirit takes place at Pentecost, and that's part of the prophecy, and it has to do with the Lord, Lord's first advent and coming, with Him uh, shedding the blood that ratified the new covenant to, to make it possible for Israel to re to inherit that land as their believers in Israel will inherit that land as their ever everlasting possession. Um, so if go to Acts chapter 2 now and verse uh, we're going to look at verse 1 through 3. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and sat upon each of them. Um, we're not going to, uh, well, let's keep reading. Let's drop down to verse 33 here. I'm not going to cover everything in my outline this morning, but um, let's go as far as we can. Verse 33, therefore being by the right hand, now these are believers at Pentecost who received this baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you go through and you look uh, who it was that initially received this baptism of the Holy Ghost and, and you know, this testimony to the other nations gathered at Pentecost, the big feast in Jerusalem and the temple, uh, it was the 12th and it was the 120. But over here in verse 30, uh, Peter is preaching to these men after the sign. And these sign gifts of speaking in tongues, every time there's a sign in Israel's program, it's to, uh, it's to, it's to be able to, it, um, legit make legitimate the preaching that they're going to do right after. So there's a message that God's giving with the sign to Israel. It's always that way. There's a sign, and it's to, it's to make, uh, it's to authorize the man speaking that he's speaking from God. So it's a sign that Israel recognizes as something promised to them, and when they see it fulfilled, they know that that's God's person speaking. So it made that, me that message something that uh, was proven to be a man of God speaking the message, the prophecy to him. Uh, so I want you to, again, look at with me at, at verse 33. Peter says, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, the Lord's, he's, his, he's testifying to Israel that God raised up the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's at the Father's right hand. See, uh, therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. That's what I wanted you to see here. He has shed forth this which you now see and hear. So that promise of the Holy Ghost that John talked about, we saw it back there. Uh, Moses talked about it. We saw Ezekiel talked about it. Joel talked about it. It's that promise of the Holy Ghost that's part of Israel's program. And we're out of time. We're